Okay, welcome back everybody to our last afternoon session. And it's a pleasure to introduce our two first speakers. It's Leon Rosik and Jan Stecker from the University of Marburg. And they will revisit the classification of homogeneous Trisasakian and Quaternion Kela manifolds. Okay, so thank you very much for the introduction and thank you to the organizers. It's really nice to be here in person and give a presentation in person again. Uh, kind of missed the feeling. Um, so this is our joint project. We, this project is together with Oliver Gertrude, um, and we recently put up a preprint on the archive. So feel free to look it up. Um, and yes, as uh, Uwe just said, we're going to revisit the classification of homogeneous three Sasaki manifolds and quaternion Keller manifolds. And we have one central theorem and that's there exists a one-to-one -one correspondence between homogeneous three Sasaki manifolds and simple Lie algebras. Um, I should mention homogeneous three Sasakian, we always mean uh, that the automorphism group of three Sasakian automorphisms acts transitive. So um, these uh, automorphisms have to preserve this three Sasakian structure. Now, as, as we said, the, we revisit the classification, so there exists a classification and you can look up the classification and find that this is true. Um, but our proof will revolve around constructing this uh, correspondence and then, well, derive the classification from that. So let's give me a short overview over the talk. So first of all, I will, um, yeah, uh, reconsider the, the classic definitions. And then I want to uh, introduce the standard classification um, of uh, yeah, homogeneous three Sasakian manifolds just so we can compare it later on. Um, and then the second step is kind of the one direction of this one-to-one uh, -one correspondence, that is, we want to construct homogeneous three Sasaki manifolds from uh, simple Lie algebras. And then uh, we have parts three, uh, three four, and five, um, which are then uh, Leon's part. And uh, so those are going to be that we uh, well, try to do the reverse first, that is kind of deconstructing three Sasaki manifolds and getting back to a simple uh, Lie algebra. Um, and then we do two consequences of our main theorem kind of, where the main theorem deals with the simply connected case. We also can, uh, with a uh, small deviation, deal with the non-simply connected case and also um, derive the classification of homogeneous positive quaternion Keller manifolds if you don't know how they fit in the picture, I will describe that shortly because that comes into play in the classical uh, classification. Okay, um, so we just heard at the talk by Christina, so I don't really have to tell you what Sasaki manifolds are, so I will just use this slide as a short uh, fix of notation. So we always have a uh, manifold M with a metric G. Uh, eta will be our contact form, Xi our real vector field, and uh, Phi will be our um, almost complex structure on this. And well, as Charles Boyer uh, said in, I think on Tuesday, there are lots of definitions for Sasaki. And, um, so when this almost con uh, almost uh, contact metric manifold is in fact Sasaki. And so I've just written out some um, and there are certainly more. Okay, now really I want to talk about three Sasaki manifolds. And that is uh, we have, Mm, 4n plus three dimensional manifold and we have three Sasakian structures. Um, so yeah, we have these, yeah, on the same uh, remaining manifold, we have these three uh, Sasakian structures, eta i, xi, i, phi i, um, and we assume that they kind of uh, interact nicely in the sense that uh, they're orthogonal. So the right-hand side is kind of what they are supposed to look like, um, mimicking the quaternions. Um, and so the, the second, uh, well, the, the second dot is just this interaction of the three Sasakian structures. Now, if you never heard of um, three Sasakian geometry, there are lots of reasons to think about them. Um, and well, I just list some of them. Um, so we, they relate to hypercalor uh, manifolds in the sense that uh, their cone is hypercalor. They are Einstein. So we have lot, heard lots about Einstein manifolds um, this week. They submerge onto quaternion Keller manifold, uh, or before, sorry, this is uh, quite important, but uh, they submerge onto positive quaternion Keller orbifolds, 
and lots of other things like they have killing spinners, they have con nice connection with skew torsion and whatnot. So the point I will talk about next is kind of related to this uh, uh, third thought of the submersion onto quad positive quaternion color or befalls. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that, that kind of comes into play when we discuss how this classification has been done uh, by Boyer-Galitzky-Mann in uh, the 90s. So it all started with Wolf already in 65 when he classified symmetric um, positive quaternion color manifolds. Um, in that case, it was still only symmetric ones, um, but Alexeyevsky proved, in fact, if, if we were in the realm of positive quaternion kind of manifolds, then these are all uh, homogeneous examples we'll ever get. So we, in fact, get a classification of homogeneous positive quaternion color manifolds. And, well, what uh, Bayer Galitsky Mann realized is if we have an homogeneous Trisosakian manifold, then, in fact, the submersion onto a quaternion color orbifold. Uh, which I just uh, pointed out before, is in fact a submersion onto a quaternion color homogeneous uh, manifold. Um, and well, just plug these together and you get the, um, well, this uh, classification theorem um, that every three Sasakian manifold is one of the following, um, well, four uh, families of examples or five exception examples. And so the four families are kind of these uh, SPN uh, plus one over SPN. So that those are the spheres. Then the uh, just next to that, that those are kind of the special cases because they are um, the non-simply connected. Those are RP four N plus threes. And they um, yeah, well, come uh, from the same well, uh, top uh, group SPN plus one. And then we have a family for S, SUN, uh, one for SO, uh, um, and then for all the exceptionally uh, algebras, we have uh, another examples. So what you should um, take away from this classification is that if we exclude the non-simply connected example, that is the uh, real projective space, then um, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the simple Lie uh, groups, compact Lie groups, and the uh, homogeneous three Sasaki spaces. So this is kind of, one sees that when, 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 when one looks at the classification has been knit out in several instances. Um, and this is kind of central to what we are going to show. So however, there are some, some small drawbacks with the classification they kind of didn't give a description of the structure tenders immediately. They have some uh, ways by three Sasaki reduction and whatnot to, to um, get back to, to the uh, structure tenders, but not, not a unified description. And well, it relies on this auxiliary classification of uh, positive quaternion color of uh, homogeneous quaternion color manifold. Okay, um, so, what I'm going to talk next is work by Christina Draper, um, Cisco Palomo, and uh, Manuel Ortega. I'm not completely sure. Um, they kind of deal with this first point of no unified uh, description of the structure tenders. Um, well, they have the following setup. So they consider uh, Lie algebras, um, H, G, not G, and they suppose that they have the following qualities that the top Lie algebra G um, splits as G naught plus G one. And they say, this is a Z two graded uh, compact simple Lie algebra. So they um, assume that kind of yeah, the uh, G naught G naught has commutator and G naught G naught G one and G one and G one G one back in G naught. Um, and yeah, then the second property is that G naught splits further into a two factors, one that is in al the algebra H and one the algebra that is uh, isomorphic to SP1, so the uh, union quaternions. Okay, so let me talk about the other part of this decomposition on top, that is G1. And uh, well, we cannot describe G1 immediately or we don't need to in this uh, setup, 
but in fact, we uh, want to describe the complexification. So they suppose that the complexification of this G, uh, G1 um, is just a product um, between just the two dimensional space and uh, some uh, yeah, complexified H modules uh, W. Now, the only thing left to kind of understand the Lie algebra of G is how does G naught act on G1? So we have G, G naught uh, acting on G naught. That works. And we have, yeah. So we need want to describe how G naught acts on G1. And well, kind of in the most obvious way. So we have that uh, G1 is just a product. So we want the action of G naught to just be the product action. So H acts on this uh, module W and the SP1 factor, which is if we complexify it just only as a 2C factor, um, should act on the uh, just trivial two dimensional space. Okay, suppose we have such a setup, then that's what they call the three Sasakian data. Um, the first observation they make is this if we kind of rearrange the splitting in the sense that we have the Lie algebra H and then this um, factor SP1 plus G1 then this SP1 plus G1 is a reductive complement. Um, this has nice properties because that means if we want to describe some structure, some invariant tensors, we need to uh, describe invariant tensors only on this SP1 plus G1 factor. And they should be a, at H invariant. Question? Yeah, sure. So G1 is not a Lie algebra, right? G, the bracket of G1 with itself is in, is in G0. Yes. So how, how do you describe the bracket of two things in G1? Um, well, we don't have to fix that. Oh. Um, maybe I've misspoken before. We, we, don't, we don't fix how G, G1, G1 goes back to G0. Okay. Um, yeah, in, in fact, it, it's not completely fixed. Um, this, this will quite vary. Um, but we don't need that, luckily. So their main theorem, um, at least with regards to what we are doing, is the following. So suppose we have a three Sasaki datum, and we take the simply connected uh, group G that has the Lie algebra small g, and H of um, the subgroup generated by the Lie algebra H, then we can define uh, G invariant metric and G invariant tensors um, by just looking at this reductive complement M. So um, the metric will just be a respective scaling of the killing form of G. So um, we take uh, different factors on, on these uh, both sums SP1 and uh, G1. And um, the the yeah well the, the other tensors the uh, rate vector fields um, will just be the generators of this uh, sp1 uh, summoned um, while well the eta i of course they're duals and uh, the endomorphisms are again we take just a joint action of the uh, of these xi i and um, put in a suitable multiple. Are there, are there questions? Okay. Um, yeah, so, so these turn out to be just the right definitions um, that they can show that this is a simply connected homogeneous pre and manifold. Okay, um, now what do we want to do? We want to kind of understand how to, how to get these uh, pre Sasakian data. Um, the first step is kind of a bit odd, and that's why I explain why in just a moment. But we complexify the entire thing. We, we say we're looking for what we call complex three Sasaki data. Um, that is, we take complex Lie algebras and ju then just the same um, property. So that we have uh, a splitting into a Z2 graded algebra. Um, and the first fact uh, summoned is again split it into to, uh, SL2C uh, summoned and um, uh, summoned V. And again, this, this other model U1 is just a product module of V and um, the SL2C factor. And then to get back to the original three Sasaki, uh, Sasaki datum of 
Therapia Ortega and Palomo, we just have to take the compact real forms uh, G and H of um, this complex species of the tail. Now, why would we do that? Why would we consider complex data? Well, the first, the first thing is, well, we already had to complexify to define um, the three Sasaki datum in the first place. Um, on the other hand, it turned out, um, and I'm not going to talk much about this because it's really not the topic of today's, but this is not the only way we can kind of, um, uh, the only thing we can extract is not only a three Sasaki datum, but also what we called in the paper with Julia De Leo and Ilka Agricola, a generalized pre Sasaki data of non compact type. Um, and that will lead to uh, homogeneous negative three alpha delta Sasaki manifolds instead of um, kind of positive ones, which uh, we are discussing here. Okay. Um, and the third point I kind of didn't, didn't really mention here is uh, which will come into play now if we want to find how to, to construct these uh, three Sasaki data. Um, well, in the complex world, we're just, it's easier to deal with uh, root spaces and they come into play right now. Okay, so let me just exercise the entire thing on the rank two examples because I can draw them. So everyone pick, please pick your favorite uh, rank two Lie algebra, any of those three. Um, and then we'll look how we do it. So first of all, we want to fix this um, summoned SP1 or SL2C in the complex case. And I've drawn them all in the same way. So I can just uh, fix the vertical line. Um, now, I could not make any choice. I, I have made some choices here. And specifically the choice I've made is I have picked one of the long routes and we see this is necessary. I cannot just pick a short route, it, that won't work. Um, so, okay, we have the SL2C factor. The next thing we want to do is kind of find what should be the isotropy. We know it has to commute. So, um, well, this, this is first a guess, but you uh, check easily that if you just take the routes that are orthogonal uh, to your to SL2C factor, that will commute. So, we have this picture where we have uh, our uh, kind of our SL2C factor, our isotropy, which makes up the U naught part of our Z2 graded algebra. And we just need to uh, consider how the uh, U1 part of our Lie algebra looks. And the thing you find immediately, there are two copies of the same thing. And that's exactly what we want. Um, we want that there, uh, this U1 module is just uh, C2 factor times uh, uh, in B module uh, W. And this is exactly what happens. And this looks quite nice. Okay, so how do we do it in general? Since these are only the rank two examples. Well, the theorem is to the follow. Suppose we have a simple complex Lie algebra um, and we choose a maxima root. So maxima root is up to a choice of uh, kind of ordering of the roots. But, but it, as we show, it doesn't matter which one we take, they are, uh, this will all induce just isomorphisms. Um, and then uh, we define, well, the orthogonal roots um, in the sense of, uh, in the uh, language of uh, root systems, that is, we pick the Catan integers. So I've uh, written it uh, below um, and uh, say we choose all the roots such that the Catan integers vanish. And then, well, we have to kind of... Okay. There is this um, the control of uh, uh, the roots that we copy as by Nilpoven orbit. So that's exactly the choice that corresponds to the minimal Nilpoven orbit. Is that correct? Um, I mean, I, I'm not sure in the language of the new code no, but, um, but I mean, don't we, know, don't we know, I mean, what I'm a bit confused. I mean, don't we know that the, basically we have to do, take the projectivization of the minimally for the orbits. That's the, 
at this was paid and we've done i mean yeah. that, 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 okay but this is more uh, legal, i mean uh, this equivalent yeah. description of this construction but how much is okay um okay yeah exactly so so where where i was going to, uh, to be where i was going to be talking about okay that's pretty pleasant um so we kind of choose the root space we just have to say what what should happen in the maximum torus and well we have this uh, uh the part that belongs to uh, to this sl2c subalgebra and uh, the rest of the maximum torus will just be the kernel of alpha and that's what we also add to the isotropy and then we can show that this is indeed a complex piece of factoring data um so I want to um, going to prove this. So the idea behind the proof is the following: um, we define by the uh, integers we define a grading of our Lie algebra, um, and we have these various steps. So that defines a z grading per se. Um, and uh, yeah, by by how the Cartan integers work and um, how yeah, taking commutators work, this is a yeah, z grading of the um, of the Lie algebra, so uh, they are just linear. If we take commutators, we will just add them up. So our two uh, two summons in the entire decomposition will just be the, the odd and the even part. Um, and uh, since they uh, they are linear, uh, so they the 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 Catan integers just add up if we take commutators. Um, this this will mean that in fact. Uh, these u naught and u one do just what we want them to do. They uh, will have the commutators as I explained before. Now, um, the first thing to realize is the following: if we choose a maximum root, um, and then this is equivalent um, to the following two two facts: that in fact the Catan integers are at most two oh, absolute values at most two. And uh, the top and bottom level are just the one root or minus the root um, we have chosen. So the picture I've drawn up there um, of the S, uh, S, SL3 um, algebra is a quite, quite the standard picture. We have these five levels from two to minus two. And the, well, the, top, and, uh, well, the top and bottom level are just the one root we have picked. Now, as I, as I explained uh, right now, we uh, find that these uh, u naught and one one is the D two grade algebra, but just by the value of what how Catan integers work. Um, then the next thing we need to check is that in fact this u naught is the commuting or is, is the sum of these two algebras, and they commute. So that it's the sum of the two algebras is kind of clear, but um, since well. That those are the levels two minus two and zero. So we, the only need, thing we need to check is that they commute. But uh, suppose that um, you pick one of the yeah, uh, elements generating the, the, the maximum root is like say in the root space alpha. So it's on the top level. If we add anything that is on the zero level, it will stay on the top level um, just by, by how this works. and and the equivalence which I stated before just tells you, okay, then it has to be again in the root space of um, uh, of, of alpha, and that uh, only leaves it back, uh, or just tells us this cannot be, it has to be here. Um, okay. Um, the final thing we need to, to show um, in this decomposition is how the model u1 um, actually looks like and well well we have these two uh, two va uh, values u1 and u uh, so the 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 Cartan integer values one and minus one and the only thing uh, the thing we need to to do is just uh, push kind of the minus one level up so that we get a second copy of our u1 level which was what we call w and how we do, do that, yeah, well, 
we look how uh, the, well, the the SL2C factor acts. It acts by just well, the top root kind of pushes upwards, the bottom root pushes downwards. So we just take the commutator by um, by the uh, generator of the root space of alpha, and then well, you check that this is in fact um, an isomorphism of the U not uh, representation. Um, yeah, uh, and that's what we want to show. Okay, with that, um, I'm going to change for uh, Leon and he's going to do the second part. Um, so if there are any questions right now, would probably be the best time to give them. Otherwise, we'll continue in a minute. So hello everyone, I hope you can all hear me. Uh, so I'm going to continue from here on. Where are we exactly in the talk right now? So as Leander explained, we are trying to prove a certain one-to-one -one correspondence. And you can view this correspondence as an actual map going from Lie algebras to homogeneous spaces. And if you do that, then the things that Leander has explained are basically the existence and well-definedness of that map. And what I'm going to show in this section is that this map is surjective. And then the injectivity is something that we've written up in the preprint, but just can't show here for time reasons. So um, what we are planning to show here is um, that the construction that Leander explained, uh, in fact, exhausts all the homogeneous Threesosakian spaces. So it, the construction might seem a bit ad hoc. You give all these like explicit um, values for the constants with the metric and so on. But this is not just some specific uh, choice that works. This is, in fact, the universal way of uh, three Sasaki and homogeneous manifolds. And what is the right setting to prove this? So we consider M to be a uh, simply connected homogeneous three Sasaki and manifold. And then we take a Lie group G, which acts on M um, in a way that is by three Sasaki and automorphisms, transitive, of course, since we're considering homogeneous spaces, and almost effective, which just means that the kernel of the action is supposed to be discrete. And of course, one can ask, does such a group always exist? And a small argument shows, yes, it does. And in fact, one choice that works is um, to choose G as the universal cover of the identity component of the three Sasakian automorphism group. So one has to show this, but in fact, this does work. And one thing we uh, show uh, in the preprint also in a later chapter is that this is in fact the only choice that works. So up to finite quotients. So if you have something which um, is supposed to act in this way, and you just omit almost and uh, take effective action, then it can only be the identity component of the automorphism group. So no proper subgroup of that can actually act transitively. And um, yeah, what is the strategy on how we're going to prove this? So um, yeah, the construction that uh, Leander explained needs two things. It needs a simple complex Lie algebra and a maximal root. So the Lie algebra just comes from the Lie algebra of that group G, which acts. And we just show that that Lie algebra and its complexification are uh, simple. And then basically, or probably the most mysterious part is where the root actually comes from in the three Sasakian structure. So that's what I'm going to try to uh, motivate. But um, yeah, as you will hopefully see in a quite literal sense, one of the contact forms is a root, but I'll make that precise in a, in a minute. Okay, so if we want to talk about root systems and well-behaved root systems, we should first show that G is in fact semi-simple. And um, how can we show that? So we first know that because we've chosen G to be a compact Lie group, um, we know that it's reductive. So the Lie algebra is um, a direct sum of a semi-simple part and um, the center of that Lie algebra. So it suffices to show that the center is trivial. And for that, we um, use a certain computational lemma, which just says that um, if you apply the contact form to the Lie bracket of two fundamental vector fields, so the bars will always denote fundamental vector fields, then this can be calculated by uh, using the fundamental two form d eta and applying this to the two uh, values of the fundamental vector field at a given point. And um, as is always the case for three Sasakian manifolds, you can, exp um, you can express this um, fundamental two form in terms of the metric and the almost complex structure. So the second equation is always true. That's not a mystery. And the first equation is just the one line computation using the Leibniz rule for the Lie derivative and the fact that we are 
I have a group which acts by three Sasakian automorphisms, which just means that the lead derivative of any fundamental vector field, when you take the lead derivative of the contact form, it just vanishes. So that's not a hard lemma to show. And um, with that, we can prove that G has trivial center. So we just take some non-zero element of G. And um, since it's non-zero and the group acts almost effectively, we know that there is some point on the manifold where the fundamental vector field doesn't vanish. And if we know that, we know that at this point, we can choose some index such that this fundamental vector is not um, completely contained in the span of one of the rape vector fields. There will be potentially more than one index, but we just need one. And since the action is transitive, we know we can choose some Y such that the fundamental vector field of Y at that point coincides with the fundamental vector field of X at that point rotated by the i almost complex structure. And then we can use the lemma and let's see what the lemma says in this case. So you get that um, eta i of uh, the Lie bracket of X bar and Y bar will be 2G times uh, 2G of X bar at P um, comma um, phi squared of X bar at P. Um, and yeah, if you know how uh, sort of phi squared works, so it's, I mean, we always refer to it as almost complex structure, but it's strictly speaking only an almost contact, uh, complex structure on like the um, orthogonal complement of psi i. But um, since we've chosen i in a suitable way, um, this right-hand side will never vanish. So the left-hand side will never vanish. And this means on a Lie algebra level, x and y don't commute. So for every non-zero vector, we've found a vector which doesn't commute with that. So it's in fact a semi-simple Lie group. And as I said, probably the most mysterious part is where this maximal root comes from. And um, to describe where it comes from, we first need to fix some notation. So we just choose any point on our manifold and we just write M in the usual homogeneous space way. So we write M as G modulo the isotropy at that point P. And then we have this orbit map theta and we can use the orbit map to pull back the contact form. So we let alpha I be the pullback of eta I along the, the orbit map. And we can look at this as one of two things if we want. So either as a left invariant a differential one form on G or as a linear form on um, the Lie algebra G. Both sort of viewpoints are useful to us in some uh, way and we'll use them interchangeably here. And then we refer to one uh, little lemma by Boothby and Wang, which they showed in their origi original paper where they also introduced the Boothby-Wang vibration. It's just a small computation, but it's one that they have done before us. And um, what they show is that the Lie algebra of the subgroup of those G such that the pullback of add G fixes alpha I, that this Lie algebra is given by the kernel of D alpha I. So here we're viewing uh, alpha I as a differential one form. So D alpha I is a diff differential uh, two form, a left invariant one on G. And it's uh, this uh, space which describes um, the Lie algebra. And um, this space, this Lie algebra contains H and it has dimension H plus one. So there's only one direction missing here. And this direction can be explained by a certain dual vector. So this is what I'm going to explain next. So we defined these alpha i to be very closely related to the contact forms. So if we look at sort of dual objects of the alpha i, it will make a lot of sense that they are closely related to the rate vector fields. And that's exactly what we do. So we um, take x i tilde to be the killing dual of um, alpha i, and then x i to just be a suitable rescaling of that. And um, then what follows is that the um, centralizer of xi in G is just H plus the span of xi. So it's exactly H plus one missing dimension. And this dimension is given by xi. xi is not contained in H. It's really a different direction here. And as I said, the xi are closely related to the rate vector fields in the sense that at that one point that we fixed, they coincide with the rate vector fields and they obey the same commutator relation on the right there. Um, but maybe one has to be a bit careful. Um, so globally, the xi bar and the xi i are very different objects. So the xi bar are the left fundamental vector fields and the xi i are the left invariant vector fields. So they will coincide at that one point, but globally they are very different objects. And if I want to speak about roots, it makes sense to fix a sort of maximal torus or Cartan subalgebra for that root. And we do this by just choosing some maximal abelian subalgebra of H first, and then enriching this to a maximal abelian uh, subalgebra of G by just adding the direction of XI. 
or we can just fix or choose it to be x1 and in particular um, as this makes clear so the rank difference between g and h is one and now we can move on to the complex picture so we complexify g the isotropy h and also this maximal abelian subalgebra to get a carton subalgebra and um, as i said before so in some sense, um, the maximal root alpha is really the contact form in the sense that we take the contact form, we complexify it, we multiply it by 2i, and we restrict it to the Cartan subalgebra, and then we get some linear form alpha, which is really a root. And how do you show that it's a root? Well, you just show what the root space is. And to do that, you can look at the following uh, complex vectors. So this h alpha, x alpha, y alpha, are just the combination of the xi in a suitable sense and the suitable sense is that they um, obey these commutator relations which are just the standard sl2c uh, relations and if you know this then it's very easy to show um, that alpha is in fact a root of u with respect to this chosen canton subalgebra and that the root space of alpha is the span of x alpha and the root space of minus alpha is um, the span of y alpha Okay, so we have a root. We don't yet know that it's maximal. This will be sort of the next thing to look at. And how do we do this? So we can first look at this Z grading of the Lie algebra that Leander mentioned. So you grade the Lie algebra according to the Carton integers with, with respect to that fixed root alpha. Um, so you get a grading into some subspaces UK. And first you show that the U naught subspace, so the zero part of that decomposition is just the Sort of isotropy algebra or um, plus the span of h alpha um, this is not too hard of a computation to show because basically you know exactly what the um, centralizer of x alpha and then correspondingly um, h alpha and so on is so this is not too hard to show and then you also um, it, it follows from that that like the plus and minus two uh, components of the grading are just um, the corresponding root spaces. This is basically the same argument that Leander mentioned before. So you, if it wasn't the case, you would say that somewhere in the top degree, you could be moving left or right. But then you show that if you move left or right, you would have something which would sort of not commute with um, the H alpha and this, this is not possible. So we know that we have a grading where the top and bottom uh, parts are just one dimensional. We know that the zero part is the right thing we want. Uh, what we don't know yet and what in fact doesn't follow from this argument is that it's a five-step grading so in, in principle there could be something at level plus three or minus three and that's actually a separate argument that i won't show here but it's one that one that you would need to do and um yeah in particular so far we only know that g is uh, semi-simple but we want it to be simple and this is something we can um, easily show so um, we know that G is already semi-simple, so it's a direct sum of simple ideals. And um, we know that the root system of G decomposes uh, according to this decomposition. So we know that the root system is a disjoint union of the sort of sub-root systems of um, the uh, semi-simple uh, summons. And um, so we know, we've shown that alpha is a root, so alpha has to be in one of those subsets. So we can just let I be the one where it's in. And um, then we would just have to show that all the other summons have to be trivial. And how does that work? So, you know, they are um, sort of simple ideas. They commute with each other. So GJ commutes with GI, but GI contains uh, in particular X2 and X3. So they are in, so they can be expressed as sort of sums of things in U alpha and U minus alpha. So they will be in this uh, GI part. And uh, we know that individually the um, centralizer of, uh, sort of x1 or x2 is just h plus the span of x2. And if you do that same thing for x3 and intersect those two, you get that um, the only way it's possible is for gj to be already contained in the isotropy h for every j different from i. And now why, why does that make gj trivial? So First of first, this would only mean that sort of these fundamental vector fields vanish at one point, but then we're dealing with an ideal and with a complex uh, with a connected Lie group. So we can transfer these things. We can just sort of apply add G to all of those subspaces and see that this would this does not only lie in the isotropy at one point, but at every point. So this would mean uh, if the group acts almost uh, effectively, this can't be the case. So there is no fundamental vector field which vanishes everywhere except for 
the one of the trivial um, sort of vector in G. And this only shows that G itself is simple, but um, sort of the complexification U here is also simple because we're dealing with uh, compact semi-simple Lie groups. So we know that the killing form is uh, negative definite. So this can't be the sort of these, this G can't be the reification of a complex simple Lie algebra. So this is uh, the part that I've omitted here, but that's also true. Not only G is simple, but also U is simple. And as I said, what does this show? So we want to show that alpha is a maximal root. And basically we've shown that up to the point where we have not shown that there is no sort of plus or minus three component, but when does that even occur? So we know we have a simple Lie group, so an irreducible root system. And the only case where you even have Carton integers of, of modulus three is with G2. And if you have the short root of G2 um, and compare that or take the Carton integers of the long root with respect to that. So this is just one special case that we need to relegate to a different section. We've done that in the, in the preprint, but it's just not that interesting to see it here. But it just goes to show that you can't choose any route. You have to choose a maximal one. And so now we know that we have all, all we need to apply the construction, and then we can just go forth with it and do that. And then we basically have, so we have potentially two different homogeneous three Sasakian structures on the same manifold. And then we have to show that they really coincide, which is then just some Lie algebra level um, computation because we've chosen sort of the right reductive decomposition in both cases. So this is, um, yeah, a bit technical. We've also written that up, but it's not, not too interesting to see it here. Um, so then I'm going to move on to the sort of non-simply connected case of the classification. And what we showed there, what was again in the sort of, uh, obvious in hindsight from the given classification is that the only homogeneous three Sasaki manifold which is not simply connected is via projective space. And the difference to the previous sections is we've already, uh, so, so far we've always worked on the Lie algebra level and now we have to go to Lie groups. And how you, can you set this up? So in principle, if you think you would have a um, non-simply connected three Sasaki homogeneous manifold, G mod H bar where H is uh, H bar is disconnected. Then you can look at the universal cover, which would then just be G mod H, where H is the identity component of H bar. And um, what can you can you say about this uh, space? So if you look at the subalgebra, the which is the the K here, uh, which is isomorphic to SP one, and this gives rise to a subgroup capital K of G, um, which sort of represents the action of the of the rate vector fields. And you can observe that H bar is in the normalizer inside of G of H and in the centralizer of K. So that's in the normalizer of H. This is always true for the identity component of any topological group. And that, it, um, that it's in the centralizer of K is basically the fact that it's just sort of a finite covering that you have there and that, that the three Sasakian structure lifts from the non-simply connected uh, space to the simply connected one. And why is that useful to us? So you can do the converse argument and say for every H bar of this form, um, you also get a corresponding homogeneous uh, manifold. So if you have any subgroup H bar of sort of the intersection of the normalizer of H and the centralizer of K, then this yields a three Sasakian structure on G mod H bar. So if we want to find out what the quotients of a given simply connected G mod H are, then we only have to uh, look at what kind of subgroups we have in the quotient of this uh, group divided by H. And if that quotient is trivial, we have no different, so no finite quotients, which are still three Sasakian. And if it's non-trivial, we have ones. And as it turns out, this quotient is Z2 for like the SPN G and um, for all others, it's trivial. And we show this by first making a small observation that you can express this numerator in a different way as just the subgroup generated by the union of H and the center of K. This is not too hard of an argument to show, but it's useful to us because it means that if we want to find out whether this quotient is trivial, we just have to find out whether the center of K is contained in H. And this can be done fairly explicitly in the classical cases. So in the classical cases, we can really just write down G and H as uh, matrix groups and just look at what the center is and see if it's contained in, in uh, K or not. This is really an explicit computation that can be done in the classical cases and in, in the exceptional cases, it's a bit more involved. So we have to cite some uh, result by Ishitoya and uh, 
Toda, which basically looked at the QK base space of this vibration and uh, looked at whether the center of K is contained in H. Yeah, one question. Yes. Yes, that's an equivalent formulation of the problem. So we played around with this but a couple then, of times. But then there's a theorem of Salomon that says that that's the only case. Yes, but we try to give a proof which is sort of self-contained inside the three Sasakin RAM. So we we yeah looked at those results and we and we uh, we've seen that there would be other ways to do this, but we wanted to find something which is sort of self-contained and yeah. But this is an equivalent version of the of the problem where you look at whether like the uh, the canonical vibration is an SO3 or an SP1 vibration. That's the same problem essentially. Any other questions? So if not, I'm going to move on to the uh, derivation of the quaternion kähler classification. So this is, again, as Leander pointed out, a known result already, but you give a different way of proving it. So originally, this was sort of the starting point for the classification of three Sasakian, and now we've turned things upside down. And um, yeah, this classification differs in uh, one crucial aspect from the three Sasakian classification. There are no more non-simply connected spaces occurring here. So in between the SP uh, n plus one and SUM, there is no uh, non-simply connected quotient anymore. And again, how do you set this up? Uh, so we look at a positive quaternion Kähler manifold um, B, and then one way to characterize those is via an, a subbundle, endomorphism subbundle uh, Q, which consists of local sections which obey the commutator relations or the sort of multiplication rules of the quaternions. And uh, then you can look at what's called the Konishi bundle P, which is just the SO3 principal fiber bundle of uh, oriented orthonormal frames inside this Q. And this is well known to admit a three Sasakian structure. And this is basically the opposite construction, the converse construction of the canonical vibration. Um, and one thing we've shown, which then is useful to us, is that if you start with a homogeneous positive QK base, we also assume simply connected, but that's not uh, technically too important right now, um, then the total space of the Konishi bundle is also homogeneous. So we can then apply our classifications and then go down to the quaternion Kähler base again. And how do we prove this? So we write B as a quotient G mod U, where G is simply connected and U is connected. And then the G action lifts to the Kanishi bundle. So G is an action by QK automorphisms, which means sort of conjugation with differential of, of an element in G leaves the bundle P invariant, uh, the bundle Q invariant, sorry. And then you can also transfer this to um, the bundle P by just applying it to the elements of the orthonormal frame separately. So we have a G action on P. And in particular, we have a, an action of the isotropy U um, on the fiber over the identity coset in that, or identity fiber, uh, the fiber over the identity coset in that, um, that space B. And then in a slightly technical way, we can construct a homomorphism from U onto a subgroup of SO3, which in a way encodes the action. So basically knowing what the dimension of the subgroup uh, V is, is enough for us to say whether the, um, the isotropy acts transitively on this fiber or not. And so since it's a subgroup of SO3, the only possibilities for the dimension are zero, one, and three. And we just show that assuming that the dimension was a zero or one leads to contradictions. Namely, if you assume that the dimension of V was zero, then this would mean that the Konishi bundle has a global section. And since it's a principal bundle, this would mean that the bundle in itself is uh, trivial, but this can't be true because it has a non-trivial characteristic class. The first Ponfiagin class of the Konishi bundle is uh, given by the fundamental four form of the QK base. So this can't be true. And uh, in a similar way, so if you assume D is one, then by some argument, you can show that this would mean that uh, the QK base space has a globally defined, almost complex structure or phrased differently, a, the twisted space of that uh, QK manifold has a global section. And then there are other results by Alexeyevsky and others which show that this also cannot be true on a positive compact QK manifold. 
So the dimension has to be three, and that means U acts transitively on this one fiber, and then by extension, G acts transitively on the Kamishi bundle P. And this helps us to prove the classification theorem or reprove it. So we, as I said, we just um, start with a QK base space. We um, know that the, so a homogeneous QK base space, then we know that the total space of the Kanishi bundle is homogeneous. Then we can apply our two um, classifications we already have, and then just go back down with the canonical vibration. And the only thing to observe here is that uh, it doesn't matter whether the total space is um, the simply connected one. So the sphere S4 and plus three or the uh, Z2 quotient given by the real projective space, they both lead to the same quotient, which is SPN plus one divided by SPN times SP1 or the quaternionic, uh, quaternionic projective space. So this gives just a new way to prove this a theorem, which is sort of independent of the previous proof. So one should probably say that this uh, idea of maximal roots being important to this classification is not completely new. So in the work of Alexeyevsky and also uh, Boothby, um, they already talk about maximal roots, but sort of in the QK case, it's more, uh, it's a bit more involved to use them because you don't have the immediate geometric structure of the rate vector fields. But then you can just immediately see that there is a sort of SP1 subgroup inside of G, and this uh, makes some of the proofs a bit easier. Okay, so we hope we managed to make you curious about our project. Uh, if you want to see a much more detailed write-up, um, you can uh, very, um, we, we hope you can, will check out our archive preprint and thank you very much for the attention. <laughs>One question, can you make a, a comment about the injectivity part or the, the uniqueness? Uh, mm -hmm. What kind of problems is there there? Um, so basically the injectivity part follows from this um, statement that I've mentioned but not shown you that no proper subgroup of the identity component can act effectively and transitively. And we show this again at the Lie algebra level by an argument which is in a way similar to sort of the classification of symmetric spaces. So what we do is we show that the reductive complement M can be uh, expressed as a certain subset of the um, set of killing vector fields on the manifold. So we say it's the set of um, killing vector fields such that um, taking uh, the covariant derivative of it has one special form which can be expressed uh, in a linear algebraic fashion. And then what follows is sort of that all the um, Lie groups which act effectively and transitively must have the same Lie algebra which will then be the lead algebra of the automorphism group. And this uh, implies that since they're connected, they have to be the identity component of the um, automorphism group. So it's about a page or so of, of an argument. Okay, thank you very much. Are there further questions? Then if not, then let's let thank the two speakers again.